and welcome to another exciting episode of Interfaith Friends Podcast, a ministry of Shepherd of the Lake Lutheran Church, where we value our neighbor's faith. We honor the sacred stories of our neighbors as we learn from one another and work together to foster a more just and peaceful world. My name is Lila Bari, Service Pastor of Lifelong Learning at Shepherd of the Lake. And today I have one of my very best friends who is not necessarily an interfaith friend, more of an ecumenical friend. We share a lot of uh, the same sacred stories, but we serve in different denominations in the Christian church. So um, I would like to introduce you all to the Reverend Dr. Trish Sullivan Bonney, who serves as a priest in the ecumenical Catholic communion, or the ECC for short. Did I say that correctly? You did. You I did know great. I said I've said ecumenical Catholic com, com, community several times, and then yes. I've gotten corrected or corrected myself, and then I can't ever remember which one was right. We would be a community in a communion. Okay. <laughs> I mean, really, same root word, right? Same thing. Right. Yeah, we, we, we like communion. That's, a, that's one of our favorite words. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, Trish, if you could please tell, introduce yourself and tell sure. us a little bit about the ECC, please. Well, first, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me. Lila, this fan club is so mutual, and it's really a delight to support you in this aspect of your ministry, because this is something that's very close to my heart, too, as you mentioned. So hi there, podcast viewers. It's great to meet you. Um, as Lila said, my name is Trish Vani. I am the pastoral director and priest at the first Ecumenical Catholic Church in Minnesota. We are part of a bigger movement. Um, sometimes it's called the Independent Sacramental Movement that's made up of all kinds of micro denominations in the United States. Ours, the ECC, the Ecumenical Catholic Communion is the largest. Uh, we're all over the country uh, and we're still kind of a, a well-kept secret. You know, um, in some regions of the country we have more churches than others. We're the first ones here in Minnesota. And the Ecumenical Catholic Communion is a, a, a group of people, a denomination that springs from another thread of the Reformation that none of us have ever heard of. <laughs> So like most of us go to, you know, we go to history class in high school. And because the life of the church um, in, in the period of the Reformation was so entangled in politics and cultural change and so, so many landmark motive, emo, moments, most of us come out of high school knowing a few names, whether we're part of these denominations or not. We know who, you know, Calvin is and we know who Luther is and we have these, the high flying big guys, you know, we tend to know them. Um, our movement began in the 18th century in the Netherlands over a conflict over governance in the Roman Catholic community. And the Dutch church split and they created a denomination that was referred to as the old Catholics. And why were they the old Catholics? Because they were doing it the old way, which was they at the time had a long, long history of electing their bishops. And when Rome took that away from them, they rebelled. So that happened in the 18th century. And then in the 19th century, there was a big ecumenical council in the Roman Catholic Church that made a few big, big decisions, including the fact that the Pope was infallible. So a lot of people know that the Roman Catholic Church says that the Pope is infallible, um, but only has said that for a little over one century. That's not a longstanding teaching, but a lot of bishops, particularly in Europe, rejected that. Uh, teaching. And they split off and they came alongside the old Catholics of the Netherlands and created these independent Catholic communities. We're very Catholic. We really embrace the tradition in so many ways. Um, and they allied themselves. Now, their label since the 1930s has been the Union of Utrecht, which was the first diocese that broke away in the 18th century. So we all trace our lineage to that movement. And it's so obscure that so I have a PhD in ecclesiology and I studied the life and history of the Roman Catholic community. I never read a single sentence about this movement in all of my studies. So that was like seminary plus a PhD program and I never encountered this. So in ecclesiology for our, for our watcher people, I want to say listeners, but it's video too. So right, right. ecclesiology is... 
The, it's the study of the history of the church, but it's done from a faith standpoint. So like if you went down to, like if you were at a big uh, state university, you might study church history and you would look at it in a sort of dispassionate way. Ecclesiology looks from the standpoint of a set of beliefs and the tradition. That's the easiest way to explain it. So anyway, so I eventually, after 20 something years in Roman Catholic ministry and working really hard for change within that system, just came to this point where I really got that I could not be who I think God was asking me to be in that system anymore. And that that system was in collision with some fundamental values that are really part of my um, Christian faith, like the idea that God loves us all. <laughs> Nobody left out. And uh, and that sacraments are Wait, what? amazing. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and that sacraments are these amazing disclosures of grace and nobody gets left out of those either yeah. and i just couldn't tolerate um the condemnation of the gay community the exclusion of women from leadership the way we punish the divorced oh. i shouldn't say we the way my family of origin i like to call them punishes the divorced and i really was very very discouraged about the um, fall out of the clergy sexual abuse crisis and the lack of accountability. So all those things kind of converged and I decided to join the ECC. I already had a seminary degree and many, many years of ministry leadership under my belt in nonprofit and publishing sec uh, settings. And so here I am in this, you know, startup uh, in Eden Prairie. We're, uh, we actually, I'm coming to you from our, we're nested at Prairie Lutheran Church off of Pioneer Trail in Eden Prairie. So I like to tease Pastor Bryant that we're go the ECC is going to heal the Reformation one church at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Because we love, you know, we love our Catholicity and we love our smells and bells and our sacraments and all that. But we also really are trying to um, create a, a beloved community in which there's a place for everybody, yeah. including non-believers. Like, yeah. actually, you could actually come and question. Um, so, yeah. So that's my little, uh, my elevator speech about my history. Yeah. yeah. Thank <laughs> you for that. It's so interesting to me how how many ways there are and how many systems right so religion we talk about religion and that's that same root word as ligament right it's the way that we find this the structures and the stories the sacred stories that we have that make sense of things and tie all of these seemingly disparate um experiences together and and right so um it's interesting to me to see how um, people find themselves connecting with different um, expressions of faith and different expressions mm -hmm. of Christianity and like how does one thing work for one person and not for another and all of those kinds of things. So it's really fascinating. And, you know, the old joke about like all you need to start a new denomination is a resentment in a coffee pot, right? <laughs> <laughs> Or a theological difference in a coffee pot, I guess. Right, right, right. right. Or yeah, right. and and the the inter, the independent sacramental movement is, you know, there are many many little micro denominations in it, and then some that are bigger like ours. And the, the honest truth is that some of them are a little kooky, <laughs> and they're really about power and people wanting to wear fancy outfits and all that. And then there's um, there are some that are just unbelievably convicted that there's something that we want to retrieve from the tradition and carry on and that there are things that we would say are not of Jesus that are, that it's time to let go of. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I think that's necessary work for all of us all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Not just in within ourselves and also within the systems that we find ourselves part of is mm -hmm. this kind of, spirit of reformation right mm -hmm. being reformed all the time um what what is it you know it's, it's yeah anyway that's all i'll say about that um it's really it's really fascinating um and and then that leads me to this question about um interfaith mm -hmm. relations too right like how mm -hmm. It's just, it's just this fascinating sort of um, way of 
holding on to how does one hold on to the the pieces of one's tradition that really are life giving, um, not just for one but for all, right? And then, so how do we stay firmly rooted in our tradition and also um, honor the sacred stories of our neighbors as we learn together and mm-hmm. learn from one another and work together more just to foster a more just and peaceful world, right? Which is mm-hmm. what um, what we have in our value statement. Um, so, and I, and I see that I, you have been a role model for me in that. Um, with your work with um, Interfaith Circle in Eden Prairie and just really the way that you carry yourself. Like you, you are like Christian through and through and so um, (laughs) open and loving and like affirming of each person's journey and each person's path. And that's a beautiful thing. So we're, um, so tell me about that fuel. Like what mm-hmm. what fuels your passion for for this interfaith work that you do? And tell actually tell us a little bit about the interfaith work that you do and then what fuels that. Absolutely. Um so thank you for that beautiful acknowledgement. Um I am on the founding board of a group in the Southwest Metro called Interfaith Circle. And in a minute I'll tell you how that got started. But you know, my heart for Interfaith understanding actually goes back to my childhood. So I was very blessed in that I grew up in a very diverse city. I grew up in Hackensack, New Jersey. I was born in the Bronx. And I grew up in Hackensack, New Jersey, which was um, socioeconomically diverse. It was racially and culturally diverse. And it was religiously diverse. And um, and it, I, was a, I was born in 59. So I was a kid in the 60s and the 70s when, you know, the whole culture was taking on the question of, you know, um, becoming more inclusive, more open-minded around race relations and other issues. And I, my mother was this, amazing person who really believed in the vision that the Catholic Church was casting in that time. So I mentioned Vatican I, which was a big ecumenical council. This is the first council since Trent, which was convened in the wake of the Reformation. But Vatican II took place in the early 1960s. And it was, you know, Pope John the Twenty Third said it was about, you know, let's throw open the, uh, the windows and let the fresh air blow the dust off the seat of St. Peter, right? So um, something kind of like that. I didn't get that quite right. But um, so my mom was just very, um, she was an activist. She was very committed to mutual understanding. And uh, right below us in the part right below us was this lovely Jewish family. And uh, so Aunt Harriet, because she's like an adopted family member, she felt the same way. So I grew up um, celebrating all the Jewish holidays. And that was a really different experience than, say, my mother would have had because my mother was raised in what we would call like ghetto Catholicism in that, you know, in the sense of the ghetto being a place where you're completely homogeneous and concentrated. So in her neighborhood in the Bronx, you were either um, Irish or Italian and you were absolutely Catholic. Right. That was the whole community. And um, so she didn't really encounter um, many people of other faith traditions in her life Mm -hmm. until she was an adult. She really wanted us to grow up with a different experience. And so I had wonderful Jewish friends who sometimes would invite me to do things with them, whether it was fun things like, you know, uh, you know, celebrating Purim or, um, you know, I so many times sat at my Aunt Harriet's Seder table and Mm -hmm. it was just like such a profound influence on my understanding of Christianity in that I always got that Jesus was a great rabbi first. Yeah. And that, you know, that he was coming in the fulfillment of a great story. So I always had that deep appreciation. And then then the less um, happy piece that kind of really cemented my conviction, because I did things kind of casually, is that um, on 9-11, my cousin John was at his desk at Cantor Fitzgerald when the planes hit the World Trade Center. Mm. And he was killed in the collapse of the buildings. Mm. He was 33, had a nine-week-old baby at home. Um, We were absolutely crushed, the whole family. But in the wake of that, what happened was, and this was interestingly enough, very gendered, because it came from my men cousins and my uncles 
<clears throat> started sending around the most horrifying emails about Muslims. Oh, just these horrible, horrible, ugly, nasty emails. And um, by then I had already, you know, gone to seminary and I knew much more concretely about things like um, the amazing work that the Roman Catholic Church had done on building interfaith relations, the beautiful document from Vatican II, Nostra Aetate, which speaks about honoring all of the great faith traditions in a very concrete way, mm -hmm. um, which does not see Christianity as superseding Judaism, for mm -hmm. example. So mm -hmm. I knew all this. And so I was trying to call out my family members here and there. <clears throat> but what I realized was that one of the fundamental differences between where I listened from and where they listened from is that I had a lot of Muslim friends. Mm -hmm. And it hit me that, you know, it's very hard to demonize the person you know. Yes. You know, I've had, I've heard this story from people who were very homophobic and then their sibling came out. And suddenly everything shifted around homosexuality for them because now it wasn't just anybody, it was their, uh, you know, beloved sister, Sandy. Right. So um, I just thought, OK, I had been part of this interfaith Thanksgiving thing in New Jersey before we moved to Minnesota, kind of casually. And it, it was fun. We used to get all the, the it was ecumenical. It was not interfaith. It was ecumenical Thanksgiving. So I went to the leadership of Pax Christi Catholic Community on Pioneer Trail, where I was raising my family. And I said exactly what I've said to you. I told the story about John. I told the story about what was going on in the family. And I said, I want to honor John by doing something constructive. I want to honor John by figuring out how we can know our neighbors better. And I think maybe coming together around a commonly held moment and values like Thanksgiving. We all do Thanksgiving, you know? I mean, you might have lasagna or not turkey or have hummus on the table, but you know, we all we all do that. And they they thought that was a great idea. And we convened uh, a group of people and that was the root of Interfaith Circle. And it came at a very important time because as, as everybody who might remember that time will recall, there was tremendous demonization of the Muslim community in general. Right. And, um, and, and re it was really hard on people. And, uh, and here in Eden Prairie, we have one of the largest African Muslim communities in the country because of all of our Sol uh, Somali refugees and immigrants who are here in the city. So, um, and we have a big, big South Asian population in Minnesota. Lots of folks who either came in on the, the wave of visas in the late 60s or came in later. And, um, you know, so we actually, Eden Prairie schools are now 46% children of color, mm -hmm. which most Eden Prairie people may not realize is the case. And that was not the case when I moved here in 97. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I have a real heart for that, a real passion. You know, I think, um, you know, every age has to interrogate its own tradition yeah. and say, how does this speak to us? And, yeah. and I think about that that beautiful quote in the Gospels, and I'm not Lutheran, but Lila will know where this is, um, <laughs> where, where Jesus says, in my, in, there, in my father's house, there are many rooms. Right. Right. There are many rooms. And, and John you know, 14. So, well, thank you. Thank you. I knew you. <laughs> You're um, they were going to take back your degree if you didn't know. <laughs> anyway, um, Catholics only got the Bible like in 1964. So, like, you know, <laughs> I'm so, like quickly um, Googling. Is there anything else? <laughs> I think it is. I don't know. I can't even see you typing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that, you know, we, we first, you know, we used that to begin to think about more expansively about our brothers and sisters of other Christian traditions yeah. and also began to see that, you know, in other, there are certain places in other, we sometimes have more affinity with some, uh, a church in another tradition that sees Christianity in the world the way we do, than we might even in the spectrum of our own self-expression, right, right? Right, you know, right, right, right. I think the Lutheran church has gone through this, the Roman yes. Catholic church has gone through yes. it. So, yeah, so it's really, um, it's very close to my heart. And um, I think it is critical work. Um, we have to give up our, we have to give up some of our rigidity about, you know, Catholicism in particular had a very, very exclusivist idea of how one 
you know, is rejoined into the divine life. And I hate to tell you, Lila, you weren't going to make it. No matter how holy and trained oh, you were. I hate to tell you, but neither were you. <laughs> I know, right. So we're past that, you know, we're past that. Like, could we now be past that enough to say the the devout Muslim who, you know, um, observes Ramadan and gives money to the poor and stands in solidarity with pe- people who have less, um, or, you know, the, the the devout Jew who sees their life as like tikkun olam to heal the world, you know, are they any, are, are we superior to that? No, I think we have a lot to learn. No, and, Jesus uh, never so, once said, worship me, not once. Yeah. Not right. once. Mm-hmm. Follow me, worship God. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was thinking about this at Easter because you know, we're in this moment where, you know, people like you and me are, have questions about, are people going to come back to the church, the churches? Mm-hmm. And what about the generation we're losing? And, blah, 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 blah. and I wonder if one of the things God's trying to do for us is get us off the idea of the church. And what I mean by that is like, that's a, that's like, a, a, I think an invention of Irenaeus in the, in the end of the first century. So the, the first PhD time that, ecclesiology. Right, that's ecclesiology <laughs> geek. You know, that, that was the first time the word, you know, church was used. But, mm. you know, could we think of ourselves like even further back? Like what, what was that beloved community? Yes. And, and what were they trying to do? And, and they were really trying to forward, as uh, Bishop Mike, Michael Curry of the Episcopal Church says, a, G, a movement. This Jesus movement, this right. like way of being in the world that used his life and his teaching and his trust in God and his love of everything as a lens for how to navigate in the world. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I've been praying about that. Like, you know, what would it mean to be like, stop thinking of us, our, our little small budding community as a church and more about like a group of people taking part in a movement. Mm. So. I love that. Yeah. I've n- I, I have no clue what that looks like. So we'll have to keep talking <laughs> <laughs> because so the other reality is we all have, we have traditions that involve spaces, particularly liturgical traditions like yours and mine. And, right. you know, we don't have bricks and mortar, but, you know, Prairie Lutheran does and Spirit of the Lake does. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, it's an interesting question. There's a tension there too, but I think it's worth thinking about and praying about yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, okay, and this is very Lutheran. I'm sure it's very a lot of other things too, but everything's paradoxical, right? It's always a paradox. Um, so there's always it's it's rarely if ever um polar opposites. It's right. all, there's always somewhere in, in absolutely. Between. And you know, we live in a culture that's addicted to the binary. Yeah, you know, that's addicted to right and wrong and black and white and truth and falsehood. And, you know, our culture is just become, and I have to say, I really suffer from this, just totally intolerant of the mystery and the grayness. Mm-hmm. We want to have it all like lined up and we want to have our way be the way and all that. And um, yeah, so, th- you know, that's like, all that's like part of what we're working on too, I think, is to yeah. deconstruct that binary. I, I tend to think of what we're doing in the ECC, like if this word was more familiar to people, I would say we're reconstructionist Catholics. And there's a mo- new movement in Judaism that's only about 15 years old. So most, most, of, most of us know like, you know, you know, Hasidic, Orthodox, uh, Reformed and... Um, you know, and that we know, and conservative Judaism, we know those four buckets. Um, but Reconstruction is Jews are actually really looking like we do in the ECC about, you know, what is life giving mm-hmm. and what comes from these ancient cultures that needs to be released or rethought or held more gently. Um, you know, I remember when I was doing a, a one of my classes up at St. John's, I had this brilliant professor of ecclesiology, Sister Susan Wood, and she's, you know, highly published. In fact, she is the lead Catholic on the Lutheran Catholic dialogue, and, um, or was for many, many years. <laughs> and Susan Wood said to us, this is totally cracked me up, she was like, well, the tradition, you know, all the different things we've taught over the years, all the different pieces, it's like, it's like a root cellar. 
and is filled with tons of jars of all kinds of interesting things that got packaged at different times in the life of the church. Doesn't mean you want to open up all those jars. I don't know, but I just loved that. I thought, yeah, some of these jars can are better left not open. They're yeah. Better. Oh my gosh. And then that makes me wonder, like, what am I pickling right now? And sticking <laughs> in the cellar that somebody a hundred years or 50 or 100 or 200 years down the road is like, oh. Oh, what was she thinking, yeah. right? Or what were yeah. they thinking? So, to or just... or in a positive sense, like wow, yeah. that's a treasure. She thought to yeah. pickle that twenty years before people were ready to try that one, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's just. Uh, oh uh, well, I'm so happy to be in the cellar with you. <laughs> And, and now, Trish and Lila coming to you from the root cellar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm so, I'm grateful for the work that you do in this world. I'm grateful Thank you. for and vice versa. You are and um, the way that you show up and just um, hold space and grace for everyone you encounter. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for, thanks for being with us today. A delight. Thanks for inviting me. All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Okay.